my antimicrobial to continue our celebration of Antimicrobial Awareness Week. I'm Karen Thursky. I'm the director of the guidance group at Royal Melbourne Hospital um, and also the director of the National Centre for Antimicrobial Stewardship. And it has been a, a wonderful journey for us at um, at Royal Melbourne Hospital because you may or may not be aware that guidance was first uh, developed um, back in around 2005 and it's been a long journey. Uh, we are aware there are many of our uh, people online who may be existing guidance users and it has been implemented in over 60 hospitals um, and uh, our team have continued to grow over that time and we have had many learnings as we've gone through and, and developed the redesign. So I'm introducing both Jenna Malecki and Ron Che who are going to be uh, doing the presentation today. Jenna is a senior antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist who is currently has combined roles as a stewardship pharmacist at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and has also been very actively involved in the guidance redevelopment, particularly both with the design phase and also with content development. Ron Che is also an antimicrobial pharmacist and he came with us from secondment from Monash and um, kindly donated him to our team. And he is a, a somewhat of a creative spirit. He's been a wonderful addition to our team and again, has been very instrumental in both, um, particularly in uh, the content redevelopment for guidance and also um, has been involved in the NAPS. So what I did, I did ask them to talk to you today about all the um, challenges and opportunities around the use of clinical decision supporting antimicrobial stewardship it is not an easy thing and hopefully that will come across today and it'll be um, it, it will be great for you to see where we've come to over the past few years so with that I'll hand over the reins to Jenna and Ron and please feel free to pop questions um, and chat um, into into the Zoom and we can either uh, respond as we go or open up for questions at the end. Thanks very much. Thanks, Cass. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ron. Um, Jen and I will be presenting today about the guidance program. So don't forget to uh, use the hashtag if you're intending to tweet. All right. We acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years and acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders past and present. So Cass has gone through a few of these housekeeping items. Just a quick reminder again, uh, just so type your questions in the chat. One of us should be available to respond or save your questions for the end of the presentation. There will be lots of opportunities for you to speak. Um, please don't take any photos or screenshots of certain slides as they are subject to copyright. Um, and these slides will be marked with the, the icon. So a quick overview of what we're talking about today. Uh, we will begin by describing the basic AMS workflow in a hospital setting, how the program supports the systems approach, how we can improve clinical practice and enable organizational alignment with national standards. We will also show you what the system looks like and share our experience integrating guidance with the EMR system. And finally, briefly describe our fit as an organization in the bigger picture of antimicrobial stewardship and digital health research. So here are some of the um, basic components relevant to an AMS um, program in a hospital setting. AMS services typically maintain an approval system with a formulary where antimicrobials are restricted based on a number of factors, such as spectrum of activity, specialty or costs, and provide ward round or post-prescription review services on these antimicrobials. Hospitals also report prescription audit data nationally. For example, quality of use is reported in Australia by the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey, or NAPS, which most of you will be familiar with as a point problem audit. For organizations with the electronic medical record or EMR system, the EMR is often the focal point of prescription review activities and plays a role in communication of AMS interventions. Bearing in mind the components described, how this guidance supports stewardship. So guidance was purpose built for supporting AMS activities such as managing antimicrobial approvals, providing decision support for clinicians, recording 
of interventions and reporting. It integrates with EMR systems to obtain and manage data useful for EMS workflows, such as identifying prescriptions with invalid, absent, or expired approvals. Guidance uses the Universal Indications List, a cloud-based list of indications and antimicrobials that is mapped to SNOMED to enable improved data quality and reporting across platforms such as the MAPS and other clinical systems. It grew from an idea to create a user-centered antibiotic physician support system implemented in ICU to improve prescribing almost 20 years ago. An uptake was rapid with over 6,000 encounters recorded just within the first six months. The program has since grown, nurtured by a multidisciplinary leadership team comprised of infectious diseases specialists, software developers, and pharmacists. Beyond this basic concept and setting, and now embedded as part of AMS programs throughout Australia, supporting a systems wide approach to AMS and enabling compliance with national safety and quality service standards 3.18 and 3.19 of AMS, and contributed to, to the reduction in antimicrobial consumption from negative resistance with demonstrated cost savings. So guidance has been in operation in various hospital settings throughout the country for 17 years. And despite my improvements performed over time, considerable effort has been invested into redesigning the entire system to ensure that the product continues to evolve with the technological and clinical landscape. The learning health systems approach by working with its users to improve its usability and functions has been adopted for this redesign. The stakeholder consultation project was conducted to identify the needs of AMS services from 16 hospital sites across six states and one territory, which also included sites that did not use the system. Some of the comments on the application included that the look and feel could be improved, accessibility at the point of prescribing was important, that the information needed to be trustworthy, that the system should incorporate all the aspects relevant for the workflow and that indication-based searching is beneficial. Almost all participants agreed that the existing content building system, Guideline Builder, an open source application needed to be replaced with something much more user-friendly. Now, content in this context refers to the decision support algorithms, the recommendations provided, the standardized list of indications and antimicrobials and links to national guidelines within the application. We'll take a bit of a slight, slight, slight sidestep here to discuss the unified theory of acceptance and use of technology, the UTOR, one of many evaluation tools which some of you may already be familiar with, especially if you have attended Jenna's session at the symposium on Friday. So UTOT is a theoretical model that may be used for socio-technical digital health interventions that suggests that the actual use of technology is determined by behavioral intention and the perceived likelihood of adoption is dependent on the four key constructs. These are performance expectancy, effort expectancy, social influence, and facilitating conditions. A recently published meta synthesis that identified qualitative studies on user acceptance of digital interventions for antimicrobial prescribing and or monitoring in hospitals were, where perceptions were classified in the UTOP performance expectancy domains in perceived usefulness and relative varnish constructs provided good insight into acceptance of clinical decision supports in this specialized setting. This table highlights a few of the domains and linked constructs in this publication relevant to clinical decision support Users value clinical decision support as a trusted and credible source of information to cross-reference or reaffirm their choices that helps identify problems in order to perform clinical interventions and a system that is streamlined and easy to use. Therefore, an increased focus on usability was employed in this redesign to create a more user-friendly experience so streamlined workflows where users can easily triage patients for review and manage and create approvals. Users can work through algorithms to receive a recommendation along with a reference to national or local guidelines in the same view. So and we retired the open source content builder and developed a sophisticated content building and management application 
the guideline writer for editing and managing decision, decision support content. And improvements have also been made to ensure that the system is able to interact and integrate with other systems, such as the EMR, to improve data flow and efficiency. Lastly, major changes to reporting are being developed to improve performance, quality of reporting, and to be more interactive to allow for real-time reporting for more regular feedback to stakeholders. These changes were developed in alignment with the requirements gathered from the consultation project and agree with the domains and constructs described in the previous slide. The content has been written and endorsed by the multidisciplinary team of experts at NCAS based on multiple clinical sources, including national guidelines, peer-reviewed published research, and expert opinion. Complete content is provided to users and implementation. However, local ANS teams can further customize this content or create additional content if required. It is reviewed and updated centrally, including links to national guidelines, new indications, definitions, and antimicrobials can be disseminated to local users for adoption. Users can request additions or changes to centralized content, and these requests are reviewed by the Content Management Committee to be acted upon. This ensures both content agility and credibility. Existing content can improve from the feedback provided, while the committee ensures that the input adds value and is acceptable for use. The Content Management Committee works with the Australian Digital Health Agency with updates to new clinical definitions and the therapeutic guidelines to manage content changes. Now let's get stuck into the walkthrough of the system. So just as a reminder, more hospital. We knew that it was essential that the guidance program is able to integrate with these systems. So this is something we have been able to implement at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, which is the first pilot site of the new guidance program. So prior to EMR, prescribers needed to move from charting their antimicrobials on a paper medication chart to a computer to obtain the approval and then going back to the medication chart to document this. And this really resulted in a, this disjointed workflow. Prescribers may have also been unsure which antimicrobials actually required an approval. And despite having posters and lanyards available, which listed those restricted antimicrobials, these were not accessed readily. So this resulted in a low compliance with our hospital's mandatory approvals policy for restricted antimicrobials. So when we moved to an EMR system at the Royal Melbourne, um, this provided the benefit that the doctors were already using a computer to chart antimicrobials. And this is where we were able to integrate the guidance program with our EMR system to allow for that more seamless workflow. So now when prescribers chart a restricted antimicrobial, this alert appears, telling them that it's restricted and instructing them to obtain an approval through guidance. The prescriber can click on the guidance link and then they'll be taken to the guidance program, automatically logged in and the patient automatically selected for them. They can then proceed through obtaining their approval, um, which they'll then need to copy back into the prescription in the EMR system. So we did see a really dramatic improvement in our compliance with our mandatory approvals policy post the implementation of this guidance alert in the EMR. So the alert was implemented in August 2020, and you can see that there was that dramatic increase in our approval numbers after this point. There is still room for improvement with our integration work though, um, as currently prescribers, once they've obtained their approval and guidance, they then need to manually copy the approval number back into the EMR system. So we're working towards improved integration using CDS hooks, uh, which is a tool that can support sending information and recommendations from clinical support, uh, clinical decision support software back into the EMR, and then that can be actioned by the prescriber. So for this, we're working with the Centre for Digital Transformation in Healthcare and using the Validatron for digital simulation works. And this will mean that prescribers do not have to copy that approval number back into the EMR manually. And if guidance um, had, make it, had made any additional suggestions, then these two can be sent back and actioned within the EMR. 
Uh, the second part of our EMR integration um, with guidance involved setting up a process for importing antimicrobials from the EMR system into the guidance program. So one of the benefits of having an EMR system is that we were able to have an accurate record of all patients on restricted antimicrobials. And this is in contrast to the previous paper-based system where we really had no idea what patients were on antimicrobials and therefore really relied on prescribers obtaining approvals for restricted antimicrobials to identify these patients. Uh, unfortunately, this was still not done 100% of the time, even though it did improve dramatically with the introduction of the guidance alert. However, the EMR system does not include this equivalent rule-based system for obtaining approvals, so we really needed to use guidance program to obtain our approvals. We also found that our EMR system didn't have the same robust process for triaging patients for review by the AMS team. And we also didn't want our quality assessments of antimicrobial prescribing appearing in the patient's profile in EMR. So we still wanted to use guidance for this as well. However, we really didn't want to have to flick between the EMR systems and guidance to identify patients for review on our AMS rounds. Um, as this really wasn't going to be a streamlined process for us. So the solution we came up with was to import the antimicrobials list from the EMR into the guidance program. So this means that for restricted antimicrobials, when there was no approval or if the patient had an expired approval, a prescription alert was created. We also added the option to import non-restricted antimicrobials into guidance, as these are still very relevant for the overall patient's antimicrobial review. These non-restricted prescription entries are only visible to the AMS team though, and they're not part of the patient's profile in guidance. However, now we can report as percent of restricted antimicrobials with an approval. Uh, where the denominator is now the number of restricted antimicrobials with an approval plus the number of prescription alerts. We also have further enhancements plan planned for this integration, where instead of the AMS team manually uploading the report into guidance, uh, we can make this an automatic upload each day. And then eventually we are aiming for a live feed um, directly from our EMR system into guidance. And again, this is something we'll be looking to achieve with our work uh, with the Centre for Digital Transformation and Healthcare um, and CDS Hooks. So continuing on that theme, uh, other further opportunities within guidance include development of new content such as COVID treatment decision support algorithms, improving the capacity to align with NAPS, with the potential for future MAPS auditing from the application, enabling two-way integration with EMR systems to streamline workflows, and embedding AI and machine learning technology into the assessments and auditing modules. And as, as always, we are keen to offer research opportunities and to collaborate. So our, our organisation recognises and values the importance of harnessing technology for stewardship and are therefore leading this research in our specialty. We have recently secured an MRFF data infrastructure grant to scale antimicrobial appropriateness of use surveillance with digital health, an NHMRC project grant for natural language processing and machine learning for invasive fungal infection and surveillance, surveillance. another MRFF grant to establish a national surveillance platform in aged care and are researching the feasibility of applying NLP and machine learning technology to automate assessments for NAPS. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Feel free to share your thoughts and ask questions. Thanks, General Ron. Perhaps um, one of the things you can talk about is the process that we went through to actually develop the decision support content. So um, most of you who have used guidance will recognise that in the past has been very much driven by drug. So most hospitals had around about 20 to 25 restricted antimicrobials on the list. 
Um, and one of the issues was that is it was difficult for us to provide um, complete decision support because um, we want to not particularly continually drive broad spectrum or, or even, you know, you need to understand the low-hanging fruit or, or what I call the under-the-radar prescribing of unrestricted antimicrobials. So um, perhaps um, you can discuss the, the uh, process that we went through to actually move from our old content to the new content and how comprehensive that was. Where do we start, Cass? <laughs> so it was, a, it's, it was the old systems um, relatively basic compared to what we've built here, as you mentioned. Um, you know, the previous system was just uh, was you could go through it was drug based, whereas this one you could go drug or indication based, where everything was built from an indication perspective, and where there are you know there are more fixed parameters in so that we could pull up cleaner data in a sense. Whereas the other one is a bit of a choose your own adventure, build whatever algorithms you want. But when you pull the data out, it comes out in all different ways. So I suppose the the content building was uh was we put a lot of effort into content building and into the building the algorithms for the content rather. So, and because we have this, we, we understand the implications that are involved in building something like this, we have to build it in a very robust way in that, you know, every change needs to be tracked in a certain way um, within the application and, yeah. and during the development process externally as well. So all that, a lot goes into this whole um, algorithm building that um, it's, you know, it's hard to see just from the front end. Um, yeah. so. It was, it was a process of um, a, con a content committee meeting together, discussing what you know what what the options were, in, in addition to you know, national guidelines um, and evidence that's out there. So yeah, it's it's a it's a, it was a long process, but I think the end result of it is that it's a robust product that can be used by um, many different settings. And I, I just I did want to answer the content question. So it's not until you actually start building out an actual algorithm that you realise that many things uh, have a dead end. And that's including in the T, even when we look at the TG content, sometimes there's not, there just uh, there isn't an answer or there is a vague answer or a vague suggestion. If you actually build out um, decision support that, that is really directed at a junior prescriber, you need to have an answer. And so part of the work of our content and multidisciplinary content committee, which included Kirsty Busing and, and the whole team, um, was to work through all arms of the algorithm. And so therefore, what we have developed at is actually quite comprehensive. And in fact, we've had to provide um, evidence-based suggestions where things were perhaps somewhat vague in, in, in guidelines. The other thing is that we recognise and one of the successes of guidance has actually been flexibility. And that flexibility really was really allowed any site to actually build out content in exactly the way that they use because they different states or different hospitals have different formularies, different patient um, complexity. Um, and many have very good um, endorsed local guidelines and that hasn't changed. So the, the way that we'll be managing the content is that there will be a central, central cloud-based content which can be adopted and modified according to the local site. Because I think it is really important to recognise the fact that there is no one size fits all for stewardship and that we need to be supporting all sites from small um, hospitals, small regional hospitals, right through to large principal referral hospitals with very complicated patients. So, yeah, one of the attendees has asked a question, what about um, <clears throat> keeping the TG links updated? So we have a very close relationship with the therapeutic guidelines and their team, and we are actually building out a, the solution will allow us to maintain TG links in, essentially um, in the universe indications list application, which means that that updating won't be passed, passed on to the end user. And I think that was one of the challenges in the past with the with the updates. Um, we're not going to do it live because I think each time we uh, we will we will probably batch the updates because I think it's really important to actually for us to review the recommendations and for NCAS to think about what we recommend. 
The other thing which is pretty cool is that because we are now into content, which is possibly more than a lot more than we were before, it allows us to respond to challenges like drug shortages and provide um, additional support when there are drug shortages and even updating algorithms to support um, our end users. Um, the other question I'll answer, Ron, and Jen, I hope you don't mind since I'm talking and I do love talking, is um, around the CERNA integration. So this has been a very interesting journey for our team. And for those of you who follow EMRs and the challenges of, of EMRs, um, integration with third party systems is very common in the US and interoperability is a key focus of EMRs in the US. In Australia, it is still a challenge to actually fully integrate third party systems with um, CERNA and EPIC at the moment, because um, there tends to be approach that either CERN and EPIC can, can provide all the required functionality. The challenge with decision support is that both EMR, both EPIC and CERNA um, function as, as I guess we've originally developed more as billing systems. So things don't happen until you place the order. And so um, building our decision support so that the user or the prescriber can decide what to do prior to placing the order means that things need to happen prior, the, prior to the order being placed. So this is why um, at the moment um, guidance, yes, it is integrated with CERNA and in EPIC. At the moment in CERNA in New South Wales, um, the SASE team currently, if you put an antimicrobial in into electronic order, you will order automatically capture the prescriber, the patient and the drug to allow them to proceed through to the approval process and then the information is put back into um, the EMR. Our optimal workflow is for not to have to have that obvious loop out loop in so that it's a more seamless process to go from developing the approval and the indication for that to be captured against the order. And so that's why we are <clears throat> going to be working um, together with the Centre for Digital Transformation of Health at the University of Melbourne using um, decision support um, CDS hooks to allow that, to, to examine that opportunity. And, and, and really that's probably where, where we need to go to more fully integrate. But at the moment, yes. And even though that's not fully integrated um, in New South Wales as well, it led to a dramatic uptick in approvals. The other thing, even with partial integration, which has been really nice to see, is that there are some areas of the hospital that typically would not do approvals, um, and the ED department is one of them. If we think about the fact that sepsis, 90% of sepsis comes in through the emergency department, and that's where Keptrax and PIP TAS, Mero Bank, for example, are commenced, actually capturing the um, early prescribing um, and indication um, NED is really important and that that is one absolute benefit that we recognise. So from our ED department at Royal Melbourne Hospital, very rarely ever doing approvals, once we, uh, once we integrated um, guidance with EPIC, we saw a, a dramatic increase. The reason why that's important is it does allow that capturing of that indication and that indication is really important for handover and, and for stewardship once they get up in the world and once you start doing the post, um, post prescription. And then I think that there's a third question from ICRA around, um, you, you can, you're can more than welcome to, to contact us around um, your needs in your states. It, guidance is, is being built out as an agnostic, what we call an agnostic application. When a new site comes to talk about guidance with our team, we try to understand whether it's going to be a single instance application, for example, Shepherd and Base, um, uh, Golden Valley Health, for example, you have their own approval system that they're using guidance as a post prescription tool. Other sites are using um, both. We, we do what is called a um, site initiation or, or use a, <coughs> a um, implementation planning study where we really try and understand what it is that you actually need. Um, and that looks at both the um, AMS workflows, um, resources, all the way through to in IT and everything else. 
and um, this makes makes it very clear so people can really understand what's required if they were to go forward. The other thing is because it can be a networked application, for example, Tasmania has a statewide licence, a single instance can often um, support many, many, many hospitals. So some of the New South Wales um, implementations have had a mixture of uh, principal referral where, as well as rural or regional. So you can actually manage precinct or statewide or network wide stewardship programs. And that's one of the great advantages being agnostic that it can take, um, it can, it could deal with a multiple EMRs in a, in a network or across the state. Um, we do use um, the, the application itself does have integrations with, uh, with the patient information systems as well as the uh, security systems for the, for the prescribers and users of the system. Um, there is no reason why we can't uh, in future <clears throat> with our decision support build in microbiology. You may have seen quickly when Ron was going through some of the screenshots of the guideline builder that we do have fields for pathology and some of the decision support specifically relates to pathology. So at the moment, for example, there may be um, you know, decision support for uh, pneumonia for, with particular pathogens. Um, and there's no reason in the future not to be able to pull in microbiology if, that, if that's the situation. So at the moment, our initial content build has been to um, first of all, fulfill all the, all the antimicrobials, as well as the most common MAPS indications. I think there's how many will we built out? 20, Ron? Is it 20? So these are common indications that we see in MAPS, pulmonary nephritis, sepsis, um, pneumonia, hospital cried pneumonia, um, cellulitis, meningitis. We, we've selected ones that we think are really important, both from a but either being very common or being important. What's the lag time for accessing to the degree? Uh, there's no lag. Uh, did you want to actually um, just show, go back to that screenshot where the content's demonstrated from? So um, guidance will support both therapeutic guidelines as well as your local guidelines, um, which is actually really important, we think. I'll just pause the recording um, whilst you screen share that, Ron. Side. Or you can, I don't think it's too hard to find me and the team at the moment, <laughs> but um, this is a good way to get in contact with us through the um, guidance support email. Okay, there's been no further questions. I'll just use this time um, to quickly plug that the next session is at 2.30. I've just put the registration link for anyone that has not yet registered. Um, it's um, with Jason Tribbiano and his team at Austin Health presenting on antibiotic allergy delabeling program. So we also have a range of programs this week, all available on the ANCAS website. Um, I'll take it back to Kaz. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining. We had quite a big big um, group online. Um, thank you so much, Ron and Jenna. I think one of the wonderful opportunities that I've had over the years is to actually have this multidisciplinary team. So guidance um, is a department at Ron Walmart Hospital. Um, we work with, uh, we have a team of around 20 with developers, um, microbiologists, clinicians, and pharmacists working side by side. It's a unique and exciting uh, work environment and, and I'm just so pleased and proud about what we've been able to achieve. Um, behind the scenes, there's been a lot of um, uh, work in developing up the risk framework around guidance because those of you who understand around decision support, there has been very tight regulations coming out from the FDA in Europe as well as Australia around um, clinical decision support systems and whether or not they're a software as a medical device. So guidance has been built out according to ISO 9001 and we've also built the new guidance out to be compliant with software as a medical device. Uh, so being an ISO compliant application, I think is really important. Um, and that means that we have a very robust um, 
quality management system that overlies the entire program, including the content, support and maintenance um, and risk. So um, uh, that, that in itself is actually a huge amount uh, of work to actually to formally build that out um, and to make sure that that's sustainable. So um, it is, I do recognise the enormous amount of work by our whole team to get to where we are today. And we're really excited about going forward. And, and me personally, having to use a very old program, I'm, I'm sort of excited too. And the other thing which we may not have mentioned too much is that we have had a, a usability expert helping to design the program. So Shri Elkins works with us. She's a graphic designer and, and usability expert. And that has been very much part of the, <coughs> the workflow redesign. And some of you may have participated in some of those sessions with um, Ron and Shri. Um, and I think that's been actually really important as well. Oh, and yes, Jenna, we've had an, epi an, an epidemi epidemiology as well. So we have a, a really, really fantastic team and uh, always happy for people interested in doing research or, or work experience with our team. We've had a long list of pharmacists who have heavily contributed to guidance. Um, Caroline Chen, uh, Catherine George, who's on mat leave, um, uh, Nicole Singh, who's not on today, but has been really influential. Uh, Rod James, who heads up NAPS, has been really important. Um, who else have I missed out? I missed out other people. Nolene. And um, Nolene Bennett, yes. So we have a, so it's been um, really great. And of course, Kirsty, who's who has been very influential, particularly in the content design. So uh, with that, um, in recognition of our team, thank you very much. And I hope the rest of your antimicrobial awareness week is fulfilling and helps to improve your own practices. Thanks, everyone. Oh, Nanha, my goodness. I can't forget Nanha. I'm so sorry. Good pick up. Ah. A special thanks to Nanha Trong, who is who many of you will have dealt with. She's our another amazing pharmacist who is our implementation lead for guidance. And she's been absolutely critical in in um, both the the development also implementation switchover. Thanks. Lovely to see all those claps and thumbs up.